The following episode of TOEFOP is rated MA for mature audiences. It may contain sexual references, time travel references, allegations of bin misconduct, and mild coarse language. TOEFOP advises that this episode is not suitable for anyone under the age of 15 or anyone who thinks a comedy conversation between two old mates sounds like a terrible idea for a show. Minors must be accompanied by a parent or guardian. This is John Deke speaking. Everyone relax, this is Tofop, I'm Charlie Clawson. I'm Will Anderson, hello. And thank you for watching. Oh, you've put a pause in now, is that a new thing? Well, I never said that I was going to say it one specific way. I I realised that I'd fallen into saying it one specific way and I wasn't really engaging with it. You know, like when you get in a routine with your partner, I'm just like, I'm saying I love you, but Mm. am I really saying I love you? So today I just changed it up. I didn't love it. It wasn't my favourite version of it, but it was something different. I tried something. I dressed up in a fireman's outfit. We all thought it was a bit ridiculous. It didn't really work, but I tried. A catchphrase is not I love you. A catchphrase is what keeps people coming through the turnstiles. Like, this is your I'll be back. Your, you know, can you smell what the rock is cooking? Like... We want you to just say the line, Will. <laughs> just say the goddamn line. We don't <laughs> yeah, want don't you to mix get set up. <laughs> don't go to the concert and then suddenly they're putting in different words or singing it out of time. I'm trying to sing along, Bono. Just yeah. sing the words how they are on the record. Uh, don't you hate that when the lead singer of a band, it's your favourite song, and he gets to the chorus and he holds a microphone out to you and you're uh, like, I didn't come here for karaoke, mate. <laughs> I did not come here to hear this clown fucking sing yellow. You fucking sing it, Chris Martin. I paid $200 for these tickets. I don't care that you're out of breath and you've been putting on a show for the last like hour and a half you sing the goddamn song monkey dance for us get fucking fitter mate get a trainer get in the fucking gym you sing not here for this this is not a choir uh now another uh episode of tofop another what's mike wearing update uh before we started rolling i did pay special attention uh he's in his university theater student outfit He's all in black, black shirt, black long sleeves. He's uh, uh, like he was a techie in a black box theatre. Okay, so you're not saying it's his actual university theatre outfit. He hasn't put on what he wore backstage at, in his university theatre days. No, nah, potentially. I mean, I'm not. Maybe. I mean, when it comes to amateur productions, Tofop's right up there. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, these are his university <laughs> theatre days. Yeah, totally. This is his undergraduate production he's involved in. He works in. with Hamish and Andy, and then he comes and does his shitbox. <laughs> Slums it with us, exactly. <laughs> this is the version of some tech who works at the art centre going down to a black box to help out a uni review. I imagine when he's doing Hamish and Andy, he's wearing a tuxedo. He's wearing a top and tails, and then he comes to yeah, Hamish and Andy's Exactly. They, they do a segment, what's podcast Mike wearing, or what's radio Mike wearing, and it's always a tuxedo. <laughs> The answer every week is a tuxedo and a top hat, as he does every week to work on this show. Now, Will, um, I've brought something to the table this week uh, Mm. that is really... When you become a parent, um, it gives you a chance to revisit some of the things you knew as a child, movies and books and all those kind of things. And some stuff you haven't seen for a while, so you're kind of evaluating it through like a a different, more mature lens. And there's one book series in particular that Iona just loves and we've been working our way through it um are you familiar with the mr men books yeah of course of course now that's interesting because i I wasn't sure i was at the playground the other day and um i was chatting to a a mum there who had a kid about the same age as i own and she was american and we're just talking about what the kids been up to and i said oh yeah i own has discovered mr men and she didn't know what I was talking about. And then I was like, what is, like, is Mr. Men, is that just a, was like, is it like a British Australian thing or is it just an Australian thing? I thought it was like global, like a Disney type brand, but maybe it's just Okay, here's here's what I remember of the Mr. Men series. I believe it was by somebody called Roger Hargraves. Correct. If I'm not mistaken. Yep. And my only other memory is, that all the Mr. characters were called things like, Mr. Awesome, you can do anything. Mm. And then all the female characters were like, Mrs. Nags me too much. (laughs) Women are real grumpy. (laughs) Miss, shut your bloody mouth. (laughs) I mean, I don't think that's universally what it was, but it always felt like they were the lines on which it was drawn. Yeah, okay. So if anyone unfamiliar with Mr. Men, yes, they have one predominant characteristic which forms the basis of uh, their adventures. And 
I've got to I've got to tell you that uh, so there's some later there's some recent additions to the Mr. Men universe. So there's, there's the classics that we know, Mr. Strong, Mr. Bounce, Mr. Small, Mr. Bump, you know, Mr. Mess, uh, Mr. Greedy, who I remember uh, when I was in primary school, uh, we were making placemats for our parents, uh, for for our mothers for Mother's Day, and I drew like a diorama of the Mr. Men characters. And Mr. Greedy, if you remember, he would always stand in profile and he'd have that long pink belly. And so when I drew my Mr. Greedy, I put the belly probably like a foot too low. <laughs> Just a little low. And so they laminated this placemat and I gave it to mum for Mother's Day. And I remember her unwrapping it and my older brother, Jamie, just piercing himself with laughter. Because Mr. Greedy looked like Mr. Erection. <laughs> Mr. Very Greedy. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of money bags in there. Uh, so there's been some recent additions to the Mr. Men universe. Um, and I did do some research before we jumped on the mics. So Roger Hargraves died in 1988. His son, Adam Hargraves, uh, has taken over the series. And so he started adding some new characters. So there's some characters called like Mr. Cool and uh, uh, Mr. Brave. And I have to say that whatever charm and magic... I guess, like, Mr. Cool, like, he's... I hope his whole plotline is Mr. Cool arrives at some new place and is like, I'm Mr. Cool, that's what everyone used to call me in my old school, in my old town. And everyone's like, you can't make up your own nickname, Mr. Cool. Well, Mr. Cool's deal is that... So there's a kid who's sick in bed and, Mm. you know, he just wishes that he was feeling better. And then, like, Mr. Cool, who's like a blue triangle wearing a top hat, much like I imagine... Podcast Mike wears when he's doing Hamish Justice and Andy. For Hamish and Andy. <laughs> <laughs> they say, "Come on, Mike, wear your regular uniform, Mister Cool, from the Mister Men series." And so he turns up, and um, you know the kid's feeling uh, not well, and so Mister Cool's like, "Well, how would you like to fly in a jet plane?" And the kid's like, "Well, that'd be cool." And he snaps his fingers, and they're flying in a jet plane. And then he's like, "How would you like to kick the winning goal?" At, you know, in, in the grand final. And so then he's on the pitch, you know, kicking the winning goal. And how would you like to do this? And so I'm like, all right, well, that's, you know, that's a clear power fantasy wish fulfillment uh, metaphor. But I seem to remember the older books being a little more about, okay, so, you know, if you missed a grumpy, for instance, then you've got to learn that that's an emotion you need to deal with. But these de- defining characteristics of the Mr. Men, normally there's some moral... Yeah, it was a message about being messy or yeah. a message about being grumpy or like, you know, there was some sort of moral yeah. in it. Whereas this one is, hey man, it'd be great to be cool. Yeah, it's like, it's like, I mean, Mr. Cool is the Elon Musk of uh, the Mr. Men universe. He just like does whatever he wants. He does, he's a billionaire. Even the fact that he's called Mr. Cool when he's really like Mr. Magic or whatever, yeah. Mr. Mr. Wish Granter is actually what he is, right? Yeah, I mean, but he, he goes home. It's even a marketing thing that he's like. <laughs> I mean, no, I reckon granting wishes is cool, so I'm going to call myself Mr. Cool. <laughs> yeah, there should have been just like a, an epilogue where it's just he gets home into his empty mansion and just like cries himself to sleep because he leads such an unfulfilling life going around and granting every child's wish. Now, is there any chance that I am underselling Roger Hargraves, Adam Hargraves and the entire Hargraves estate? But is Mr. Cool like mystical? Is he mystical, Mr. Cool? Like no. is he able to... Uh, You're not underselling. Because that would have been... If I was like, oh, because, Mr. Cool, mystical. But the, you, you can tell there is a there is a clear writing difference. Like the other thing I'll say about the Mr. Men books, the Roger Hargraves penned ones, is they're terribly written. Like just terrible structure, just the uh, the syntax is awful, nothing, like they're repetitive, everything about it is bad. They're the charming. Man, the, the, the man's dead, Joe. <laughs> Give him a break. He's rolling over in his Hargrave right now. Yeah, he's Mr. Dead, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Mr. Stinky now? Uh, but there is a charm to the, you know, just the simplicity of it and obviously the drawings and all that kind of right. stuff. But then with the, the Adam Hargrave stuff, like there's another one called Mr. Brave where it doesn't actually make any sense, where Mr. Brave's whole thing is, Mr. Brave's a small little character, you know, with glasses and stuff, so he's a real nerd. And uh, Mr. Brave is on his way to Little Miss Bossy's house, and he doesn't want to be late, because Little Miss Bossy, you don't fuck with Little Miss Bossy, that's what I... No, because you know what women are like, yeah. Bossy. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> All the time. So along the way... Um, he runs into other Mr. Men's and Little Misses and, you know, helps them. He he keeps saying that I'm not brave, I'm not brave, but then he'll do something brave, like, you know, get a cat out of a tree or whatever. But then the very last thing is, um, uh, uh, you know, he 
he helps someone down from like, I think it's Little Miss, I think it's Little Miss Somersault. She's a gymnast and, you know, she's stuck doing something and he helps her. And then he runs off and he's like, but I'm not brave. And then one of the other Mr. Men turns to another Mr. Men and goes, but he is brave because you have to be brave to go hang out with Little Miss Bossy for an afternoon. <laughs> and oh my like, God, Roger, put it away. No, that's Adam. That's what I'm saying. Like they get a lot oh. worse when Adam takes over the franchise. Oh, like more misogynist, you reckon, when Adam's like... Pretty much, but also completely misses the point, like this simple moral lesson of the Mr. Men franchise, <laughs> which is like, you know, generally if it's a negative trait that this person has, they generally overcome it by the end of the story or if it's a positive trait they lose it and then get it back or they learn to share that positive trait with someone else that's the general formula for mr men but the reason i bring all of this up will is that i came across the the very first mr men story and oh sorry the other thing about mr cool before we get to this is that when i'm reading it to iona um i have to do voices and I've been experimenting with the Mr. Cool voice and I didn't. All right. Let me give you my Mr. Cool voice and tell me if this like, um, if this, if this reads cool to you, you might need to close your eyes. I don't know. But like if I go, okay. Hey, it's Mr. Cool. You want to go flying on a fighter jet? Yeah. Okay, you know what I'm going to say? What? Is it did help to close my eyes. Yeah, And right. I hope that other people listening close their eyes also, unless you're driving or something. <laughs> but if you were in a place where you could close your eyes, it does actually help. Even, like, rewind a bit. Close your eyes, have a listen to that, because I was able to disassociate. So... Because hmm. I thought it was... I started worrying, and I was already committed, and I didn't want to change the voice after through the read, that he was sounding sleazy. Like... Mr. Cool is the guy who you start the evening thinking he's cool, but then yeah. you start to realize, oh, he wants me to Mr. do... I don't reckon Mr. Cool is that cool. No, and he's wanting me to do drugs and stuff. And he's actually Turns like... out the guy who's 20 years older than us who was hanging out at his bar and immediately <laughs> became friends with us and offered us drugs isn't as cool as we immediately thought. That's exactly... Now that we've hung out with him for a while. That's the vibe I got because that's Mr. Yeah. Cool's thing is he goes around and... Funzy. I'm, I'm assuming from this one book, he goes around and just cheers up kids, like, you yeah. know, finds out. And it's like, hey, Mr. Cool, why aren't you hanging out with... Other Mr. Men? Like, you're Mr. Man. Uh, Hang out with... Mr. Mr. Can't visit a school. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> right. Well, that ties in nicely to what I want to talk about, the thing I actually want to talk about. Okay. So, the very first Mr. Men book that was written was this one. Oh, uh, Mr. Tickle, of course. Yeah, I remember Mr. Tickle. Mr. Tickle. Like this, it's a classic. Classic. Right. Now, Tofop, a comedy conversation between two old mates. Not a true crime podcast. But I get the feeling. Yet. <laughs> Yet. I want to do, I just want to try an experiment. And look, uh, Podcast Mike, feel free to shout me down because this is going to require some post production. But I'm going to read some passengers, passengers, passages from Mr. Tickle. And I want you to just put a, in a bed of just like true crime music. You know, that kind of foreboding true crime music you get. When they're sort of talking about, and then we discovered that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Because it's written in a very innocuous, semi-charming fashion. But I'm going to read it like it's a true crime podcast. And then you can give me some feedback. Okay. So, Mike, uh, you can start the music bed now. Ominous. It was a warm, sunny morning. In his small house at the other side of the wood, Mr. Tickle was asleep. Now... Already, Mike, you can stop the music here if you want. It's fine. It's up to you. <laughs> Already, like the name Mr. Tickle. Like, you know when the police come up with a name yeah. of, like, for a pedophile or something it's like that? Absolutely something like Mr. Mr. Cuddles. Tickle. No, Mr. Tickle. <laughs> Mr. Tickle. All right, so Mr. Tickle was asleep. <laughs> you didn't know there was such thing as a tickle, did you? Well, there is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, See? Tickles are a chill went a chill went down my spine. <laughs> Tickles are small and round, and they have arms that stretch and stretch and stretch. Extraordinary long arms. Oh no! All the better to strangle with you. <laughs> Mister Tickle was fast asleep. He was having a dream. It must have been a funny dream because it made him laugh out loud. And that woke him up. A maniacal, you know, a maniacal laugh that awakens <laughs> yeah. you from your slumber. 
<laughs> you know, in true crime podcasts, they often they'll do a bit of this kind of like, you know, they'll color in yeah. the edges a little bit. They give you a bit of like, you know, speculation about what that person was thinking the morning of the thing. He sat up in bed, stretched out his extraordinary long arms, oh. and yawned an enormous yawn. Oh. Mr. Tickle felt hungry. So do you know what he did? Oh, dear God. Tune in next week for part two of this true crime expose, Mr. Tickle. All right, so this bit's not so bad. Okay. He just reaches his extraordinary long, long arms down the stairs, through the kitchen, into the kitchen cupboard, into the biscuit tin. He takes out a biscuit, back up the stairs, through the bedroom, back through the door uh, to himself in bed. So... That's not so bad. Kind of cute. But then you think about that X-Files episode, Mr. Toombs. Remember that? Oh, he was yeah, that absolutely. creepy dude who could elongate his body to get out of drains mm-hmm. and shit. So if you put a bit of that kind of imagery, or the thing, John Carpenter's the thing, you know, it's unnerving. <clears throat> All right, back to the true crime podcast. As you can see, it's very useful having arms as long as Mr. Tickle's. Mr. Tickle munched on his biscuit and he looked out the window. Today... Looks very much like a tickling day, he thought to himself. Oh, 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 time to tickle. <laughs> no. Oh, no. Now, in all the talk of cancellations, yeah. how has this not come up yet? I bet they've come for Roger Hargroves at some stage. Well, Maybe didn't... not Mr. Tickle specifically, but I bet over the sexism they came for him. Well, Ro- didn't so Mr. Doc- Mr. Zeus, Doctor <laughs> Doctor Zeus, he's <laughs> a state, Zeus or Doctor Zeus if you want. They voluntarily uh, withdrew certain titles, right? Yes. That had outdated and racist kind of uh, uh, references in them. So, what's as do you reckon Adam Hargraves is just high on the hog? He's like, fuck it, man, no way. <laughs> Adam Hargraves got to no. get paid. And mate, I am the new Mr. Tickle. <laughs> Later that morning, after Tickle had made his bed and cooked his breakfast, he set off through the wood. As he walked along, he kept his eyes very wide open, looking for somebody to tickle. A dangerous loner lingering by the woods, looking for someone to tickle. And this, I'll just repeat this bit, because they emphasise it. He kept his eyes very wide, looking for somebody to tickle. Looking for anybody to tickle. Oh no. You can't just tickle anybody, Tickle. (laughs) This is where it gets real sketchy. Oh, no. Do we need to take an ad break? (laughs) (laughs) MailChimp. (laughs) Eventually, Mr. Tickle came to a school. (laughs) No. No. (laughs) No. There was nobody about. So, reaching up his extraordinary long arms to a high window ledge... Mr. Tickle pulled himself up and peeped in through the window. (laughs) Well, you know what long arms are good for? Pulling yourself and peeping in. Inside, he could see a classroom. Oh no, Mr. Tickle, (laughs) you cannot be doing this. There were children sitting at their desks. Yes. And a teacher writing on the blackboard. That's what happens in a classroom. It's none of your business, Tickle. Move on with your day. I mean, these were written in the 70s, and I know things were different in the 70s, but surely at some point... uh, appropriate for like a a loner to walk along and tickle someone through a classroom window? This was... Still appropriate in the 70s, inappropriate in the 70s. (laughs) This was the book that launched like a global empire. They've sold over 100 million copies of Mr. Men books. This was the very first one, and no one in 1971 or whenever, whenever it came out was like, hmm... Someone should just go pay a visit to Roger Hargraves. I mean, you know what the thing is? It's funny that they actually got, like, less controversial. Like, because normally if the first one's the big success, like Mr. Tickle, you would have thought the next one was Mr. Fondle or whatever, right? Yeah. Like, that's the direction you go in, but they actually backed off. Well, there was a board of plans for Mr. Bigot. Uh... (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Tickle waited a minute. And then he reached in through the window. Mr. Tickle's extraordinary long arm went right up to the teacher and paused. And then he tickled. The teacher jumped in the air and turned around very quickly to see who was there. But nobody was there. 
Wasn't Ash Williams? Wasn't he like he was like a he was a tick he was a tickle er for hire or something? I believe so. That I mean, look, you know, that's fine. I'm not here to kink shame anyone. If your fetish is tickling somebody and you can find somebody who's willing to let you tickle them or vice versa, then that is absolutely fine with me. However, <laughs> when it comes to you classrooms, you can't just be randomly sticking your arms in classrooms and tickling the teacher. Mr. Tickle grinned a mischievous grin. <laughs> I bet he did. <laughs> <laughs> he waited another minute and then he tickled the teacher again. Oh. This time, he kept on tickling until soon the teacher was laughing out loud and saying, Stop it, stop it, over oh, dear and God. over again. Oh, dear God, tickle! <laughs> right. Oh, dear God. Does that sound like enthusiastic consent? It does not. It sounds like the complete opposite of enthusiastic consent. It sounds like enthusiastic non-consent. It is somebody literally saying the words, stop it, stop it, stop it. (laughs) Enthusiastic dissent, I believe. All the children were laughing too at such a funny sight. Yeah, terrified. Terrified out of their minds. I mean, imagine you're in the... Put yourself in the shoes of these children. They've just seen this extraordinary long arm come in through the window and assault their teacher. Right. I mean, maybe they would find that funny, but that, like, it's not on them. They're children. They don't understand. There was a terrible pandemonium. I mean, look, if the drawings are anything to go by, the kids are enjoying themselves. Yeah. I mean, they're not photos. They're not a recreation of the day, but it does seem like those kids are into it. Eventually, Mr. Tickle thought he'd had enough fun. <laughs> He's evil. Oh, Tickle. So he gave the teacher one more tickle for luck and then very quietly brought his arm back through the open window. No remorse. No apology. Like, if this was a court of law, and this was the statement that we've just read, I would just turn to the jury and say, no more questions. The prosecution uh, rests. Mr. Tickle, you may have long arms, but something that has even longer (laughs) arms is the law, my friend, (laughs) and you are going to prison. (laughs) Chuckling to himself, he jumped down from the window, leaving the poor teacher to explain what what it was all about, which, of course, he couldn't. Then Mr. Tickle went to town. So gaslighting. That's the next thing that happens. The teacher's gaslighted. He's trying to say to people, you don't understand. Like, it felt like an extraordinary long arm was tickling me. Yeah, right, mate. You're right. (laughs) You're having some kind of... As if a complete stranger would wander by with extraordinarily long arms... And tickle you. Not once, not (laughs) twice, but thrice. (laughs) And what a day Mr. Tickle had. He tickled the policeman on traffic duty at the crossroads in the middle of town. It caused an enormous traffic jam. Bloody hell. All cops are ticklish. If it's not bloody tradies, bloody protesting a tea break, it's Mr. Tickle (laughs) holding up traffic by molesting a policeman. (laughs) He tickled the greengrocer just as he's piling apples neatly in his shop window. The green grocer fell over backwards and the apples rolled all over the shop. Well, that's bloody destruction oh, that's, of property. Yeah. And assault. <laughs> and Common assault. assault and destruction of property. And at the railway station, the guard was about to wave the flag for the train oh. to leave. As he lifted his arm in the air, oh, no. Mr. Tickle tickled him. And every time he tried to wave his flag, Mr. Tickle tickled him until the train was ten minutes late leaving the station and all the passengers were furious. <laughs> So hang on, so you literally interrupted a safety professional doing their job for 10 minutes making everybody on board that public transport angry to pass that on for the rest of the day. This man is a monster. Mr. Sex Pest would have been a more appropriate title for this character, don't you think? At least if it was Mr. Punctual Sex Pest. Like, I mean, Tickle, like, all these people are 10 minutes late as well. Yeah, (laughs) you're right. That day... Mr. Tickle tickled everybody. He tickled the doctor. He tickled the butcher. Tickling the butcher does sound like a sexual euphemism. It's like, hey, it sounds like me, like if I was amongst a group of men and they were all coming up with like manly ways to say they were going for a piss. Yeah. Like, and you know, yeah. I, it came to me and I'd be like, guys, I just got to go and tickle the butcher. No, it's more about having a wank. Well, don't you reckon? Tickle oh, the butcher. Because uh, of sausages? Is that what yeah, you think? Yeah, because of meat. You're going to go rub the meat, tickle the butcher. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're two different things, and please do not get them confused. Now, just take a look at this illustration, which I okay. think is kind of like 
Oh, oh boy. So describe that for the listeners. Okay. Well, he's in a like very traditional sort of round um, British hat, like a, a like the how you draw someone in middle management, public yeah. service. I assume that's like the, a, the doctor, not the butcher. Oh, yeah. Well, you'd think so. He's got stripy pants and he's got some sort of... He's got glasses, so you think he's the doctor. Yeah, but the important part is where's Mr. Tickle? Oh, my God. Mr. Tickle is lingering behind a bush. <laughs> lingering behind a bush like a common sex pest. Like, that is the cliche. Tickle. You always hear people talk about sexual assault and they say, look, it's very rarely like a random attack. It's generally, you know, someone known to the victim. And it's like, yeah. not in the case of Mr. Tickle. He fulfills the stereotype. Yeah, he's, he's tickling everywhere. This is, <laughs> not a good, this is not a good book. <laughs> I told you. I felt very conflicted reading it to Diana. He even tickled old Mr. Stamp, the postman. I mean, that is funny. What are the odds? The, the, <laughs> the, the postman's name is Mr. Stamp. <laughs> I mean, what what are the odds that a guy who loves tickling so much, his name is Mr. Tickle? I mean, this That's is a, a town point. of great coincidences. He even tickled old Mr. Tant, the postman. He dropped all his letters into a puddle. Well, look, listen here, Stamp. You've got a job to do, and just because you've been tickled, that's no excuse to ruin our mail. I disagree. This is on tickle. That's like destruction of... Like, that's a crime, again, interfering with the mail. All right. A, a podcast, Mike, while we're just... Um, yeah. Can you just do a little bit of, like, research? Can you just find out what's a, what are the sentencing laws for, like, common assault, um, destruction of property? Like, how many years do you reckon tickle? Just see, just grab some, you know, things offline. What, what are we looking at? I'm going to say, what would you give him for this, Will? 10, 10, 10 years? 10 to 15 years? I'm going to give him like, multiple, like, multiple assaults plus, like, some destruction of property and stuff like that. Um Oh, I would say like at least five years for each of the crimes. Oh, right. Well, there's, then, mo- mm, there's so many victims yeah. though. That he's going away for life. So I'm going to say like he gets like 500 years and he gets like... <laughs> <laughs> well, we, don't, we don't know how long a Mr. Man lives for. Like 500 years might be like a, a day to him. He's like, he's laughing. He's, been, he's eternal. <laughs> he's been around since the dawn of time, tickling bloody woolly mammoths. He laughs at your sentence. <laughs> All right, so Mike's got some info. So common yeah. assault can be three months. Okay, right. All right, three months. months for, three months for every case then. Okay, He's aggravated getting... assault is six months. Well, it's not mm-hmm. aggravated, is it? Or is it? It's premeditated. What's the difference between <laughs> common and it would aggravated? Pretend, I think it would depend on the, the victim's... Like if the victim's genuinely... Like if the teacher genuinely thought it was a bit of a laugh and it wasn't like, you know, sexual and but was still felt like, hey, you shouldn't be tickling me then I guess that's like more common assault. So okay. they well, get three months. Let's, three months for each one though. No, nah, I reckon we throw the book at him. Six months for each one of those. <laughs> we throw the Mr. Men book at him. <laughs> Destruction of property can be five years. So okay. the greengrocer has got cause for that. Um, the postman and, well, I guess whoever whose mail was being delivered could also, like there could be like a like a class yeah. action. Well, you never know what was in there. Exactly. I mean, it could have been my, it could be my beard trimmer. <laughs> He's possibly the world's greatest criminal and he should go to prison forever. How about Mr. Electric Chair? Uh, destruction of property can take a... <laughs> Sorry, I just got the Mr. Lethal Injection. <laughs> uh, destruction of property can carry up to 10 years if it involves fire or explosives. Yeah, but what about tickles? Yeah. Podcast, Mike. What if, the, uh, <laughs> what, if the, what if the destruction involves tickles? Um, okay. After his rampage, that's my editorialising, Mr. Tickle went home. Sitting in his armchair in his small house at the other side of the wood, he laughed (laughs) and laughed every time he thought about all the people he tickled. We should refer to them as victims, I think. The victims. Yeah, absolutely. All the victims of his tickling. So, if you are in any way ticklish, beware of Mr. Tickle. And those extraordinary long arms. Well, fucking- Way to fucking victim blame. <laughs> it's not on people to avoid walking through the park at night so they don't get tickled. It's up to the authorities in town to make it a safe environment to walk around ticklish or not, knowing that you're not going to get tickled against your will. Ah, uh, come on, Will. I've seen you wear those tight t-shirts with your ribs yeah. all exposed, just asking <laughs> for a tickle. Yeah, exactly. Crop tops, just <laughs> hanging Sides my pits cut out. out there. Come on. Just think, perhaps.
Perhaps he's somewhere at this very moment while you're reading this book. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. man. Perhaps. If you look into a mirror and say Mr. Tickle <laughs> five times. <laughs> Perhaps that extraordinary long arm of his is already creeping up the door of this room. Perhaps it's opening the door now and coming into the room. Perhaps before you know what is happening, you'll be well and truly tickled. Bam, then you hit the end credit music. Mike. Oh my God. Terrifying. 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 <laughs> I just am thankful Iona, I hope, is too young to understand. I'm never reading that book to her again. The amount of children that must have had subliminal nightmares based on being read that. Well, he looks... It's actually terrifying. Like, I don't think I'll sleep well tonight <laughs> on the back of that. <laughs> there is something kind of, like, the way it's... The, I mean, he's cute. You can't deny that. Like, he looks cute. He's a little smiley face with these long spaghetti arms. But every... Plus, tickling is quite innocent when you're a kid. Like, you know, mm. I've seen parents with their kids, they tickle their kids. Like, it's part of, like, having, like, you'll tickle, like, a baby, but even, like, it's a plaything that you do with, like, young people, right? Yeah. I can't remember the last time I was ever tickled in a serious way. Like, mm. uh, I can't, like... I mean, I honestly cannot think of one instance since I was a kid where I've been tickled. Like, it sort of stops around about 10 or 12, doesn't it? Are you a tickler, though? Does Iona like to be tickled? Not like your traditional run my fingertips on her ribs, but I might, like, blow a raspberry on her belly. Or I'm more of a... What she loves is I pretend to eat her limbs, (laughs) which is probably just as horrifying. But I will. I'll like. I'll like. She thinks it's hilarious if I if I pick off all of her toes, eat her toes one by one, and then I'll gobble down her foot, and then I'll eat her calf, and then I'll rip off her kneecap, and then I'll chomp on her thigh. She thinks that's pretty funny. <laughs> and I, because I make I make a point of like when I get to the big toe, it's the hardest one yeah. to get off. So you're like, really, gotta put some work into it. And so she so thinks that's hilarious. And I assume that's all to do with the kind of sensation of being of being tickled. But now that you've made me pause and think about it i'm like am i uh am i messing her up <laughs> is she gonna have some kind of weird association with cannibalism well maybe yeah i mean maybe you're not just doing enough traditional tickling it feels like you've graduated to a whole new thing well I, I <laughs> maybe can't... you just need to calm down a little bit get a little just coochie coochie coo going i do seem to remember with old having older siblings because you're the oldest or is your sister older than you i'm the eldest you're the eldest my older siblings, it was a dominance thing where generally two of them would hold you down and tickle the shit out of you. And that was generally like, it was a power play. It wasn't about, you know, like, it wasn't meant to be fun. It was all, you know, everyone's having a good time. It was the person being tickled is is definitely the victim in that scenario. Are you ticklish? I'm sure we've talked about this before, but... Um... I don't know that I – I think it's – I'm not traditionally ticklish. I, I know when, I, when I've had a massage, generally around the backs of my legs, my thighs is ticklish. Like that's the I, – I, I kind of always flinch when someone touches there. But it's not like a tickle – I don't know. It's a weird. It's more like – I don't know. I don't like being touched there. Is that ticklish? I mean – Are you ticklish? I think I'm only a very small amount of ticklish. Like I'm not – not ticklish like there's been times in my life where but no i wouldn't say that i have a high susceptibility to being ticklish no i mean i wonder if there are some people who are like more attuned because it's psychological right isn't that what they say that's why you can't tickle yourself because once you can anticipate the tickle it's no longer you can't tickle yourself i think that's right Podcast, Mike, can you look up why you can't tickle yourself? I would love to know why we can't tickle ourselves. I'm pretty sure that's right, though. It's like your brain is already anticipating where the contact's coming from. So, What if I grab my own toe and pretended to eat my toe? (laughs) (laughs) Would that work? Depends how much acting you put into it. But I'm just trying to think if... No, I I don't think... Maybe, like, I'm sure someone... I'm sure Gemma at some point has, like, you know, come up with the back of my neck, being cute or something with like a feather or something just to kind of get my attention. So, yeah, I'd say I'm ticklish, but I can't remember laughing at a tickle. All right, here we go. Podcast Mike's got an answer for us. The answer lies at the back of the brain in an area called the cerebellum, which is involved in monitoring movements. 
Our studies at the University College in London have shown that the cerebellum can predict sensations when your own movements cause them, but not when someone else does. When you try and tickle yourself, the cerebellum predicts the sensation, and this prediction is used to cancel the response of other brain areas to the tickle. Isn't that interesting? So, theoretically, is that how monks stop pain? Because you're basically controlling your nerve response, right? I mean, that's a giant leap, but <laughs> but it could be. It could be vaguely the same thing. It felt like you took a real big, <laughs> just like, I guess this is the same as monks and not being able to feel pain. I guess well, maybe. Con- controlling pain. Well, isn't that the, well, who, yeah. we were talking about this the other week. Who were we talking about? They, they use like some kind of like meditation or something to control or desensitize. Was it Vim? Yeah. Hoff? No. Well, yes, yeah, but right. you can, yeah, you can obviously breathe and meditate and do those sort of things to change your condition. Um, so obviously, the sensations we get from tickling are some sort of alert, right? Mm-hmm. Like you know, so this is the equivalent of them saying we're just going to run a fire drill. You don't need to go and like grab the fire extinguishers or whatever. <laughs> like you know, we know that this is like a drill. We don't need to go into full panic mode. I guess so. But you still feel it, right? Like it feels like you're still getting this sense of like, all right, so I'm just I'm just tickling my neck yeah. now, right? It's not making me laugh, but you're getting those kind of tingling. Yeah. You know, so it's got to be more because I imagine. Could like, you? You know, there's that old joke where people are like, you've got to sit on your hand and, yeah, and until it's dead so, that you can, so you can, make, so you can tickle the butcher. Called? The welcome stranger. Is it called the welcome stranger? Yeah. Isn't. The Welcome Stranger, Australia's biggest ever gold nugget that they found, wasn't <laughs> well, it called The Welcome Stranger? Yeah. What a way to celebrate, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most hardcore soggy sayo game of all time with The Welcome Stranger. Uh, yeah, What do you? so what about The Welcome Stranger? Well, could you welcome stranger yourself into tickling yourself is what I'm going to ask. So if I like no. sit on my hand until... Because you still know... Because I still know... That your arm's coming towards you. I mean, what if I, I sat on that side of my brain for a while? <laughs> <laughs> Till my brain was numb and then gave it a go. I mean, maybe. Hey, um, uh, Norm MacDonald died this week. That's uh, That was sad. I was surprised by how much um, that affected me. I really... Like I, w- I, w- I wouldn't say that like I was the sh- biggest Norm Macdonald fan, but when after he died and then everyone starts posting everything, I mean, I've read his book and everything, and then you start to realize just how much stuff I'd seen him in over the years. Like it was really, um, I, I lost a pretty much an entire day just watching what everyone was posting. Um, so I, I want to put this little caveat here yeah. because in the last couple of days, I have seen a couple of posts from some people, some like female comedians. I follow who for like documented a few experiences that they might have with norm that weren't right. like the great stories you would love to hear about somebody and how they behaved um i'd actually said to somebody the other day that one of the things that it was amazing about him was i'd only ever heard good stories right. about him well it turns out it, you know maybe they're not all good stories which is you know the case with a lot of people and and you know sadly the case with all of us probably at some stage in our lives um, so I don't know where he got to on that or what his feelings were on that or any of those sort of things. But, um, he, as a comedian, like the timing, well, he had the great gift. We had Aaron Chen on question mm. everything, um, the same week. And it was really interesting to compare the way that they both work, which is they have these moments where it appears like they don't know what they're doing. But by the end of what they're doing, it becomes so apparent that they've known what they were doing the entire time. And that is such a great trick or like way of performing to be able to like tell a story where you genuinely sucker the audience or the host or the person you're telling the story to into the idea of going, he does not know where this is going and then land it in a way that actually reassures you that he could have only know where it was going the entire time. Yeah, well, have you read Based on a True Story? I don't think I have, no. So I didn't, when I bought it, I thought it was just going to be like another one of those, you know, SNL kind of autobiographies where it's just like stories about meeting Lorne and stuff. But 
it is it's it, it is so many things it was baffling because it's 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 basically um tiny bit of truth with a lot of fiction but he veers around and he does this thing where he he'll write something like that's really sincere or you know um really literate like referencing kind of old russian novels and stuff and then just take like a you know be the, make the most base dumbest joke on the planet and so you're constantly like I, I remember finishing and going i don't know what i just read and i said i think that's the point like i think that everything he was doing in that book was almost like a satire of of these kind of egocentric celebrity autobiographies where they do just go through and list you know their meeting with lawn michaels and then moving on to do this and do that he just was like no no i'm just going to flip everything on the head like there's a there's an overarching story about him being a gambling addict which i think is actually true that he's he lost his money many times over and being on the road to vegas to lose the last of his money again and taking drugs and all this kind of stuff so that's the kind of overarching story and then there are these memoirs in between but there's also like really like moments of sincerity where he talks about being in love with sarah silverman because they were on the same cast together on on saturday night live and and you just got this real sense and so it was interesting because when people started posting all this, you know, all their, all the, these comedians posting their memories of him and then Sarah Silverman posted stuff and then she posted videos of them together and stuff because they'd worked together lots and lots of times. You're like, oh my God, like you can actually sort of see that he did sort of like hold a candle for her and stuff. But what a, what a talk show guest. Like has there ever been anyone better to have on the couch than him? I mean, that was his... Like there are people who are just great talk show guests and he was that absolute person. Like you were just happy to watch him tell a joke for four minutes. Like, and he was always one of those guys that the hosts were delighted to have there, Mm. you know, because they're reliable but unpredictable, which is just exactly the sort of energy that you want on one of those shows. um, We've talked about that Gary Shandling documentary before, but one of the things that always stuck with me with that is, you know, where, Gary Shandling was trying to go with his comedy by the end. And, you know, the the big sort of, he has this big argument with Jerry Seinfeld at one point um, about, you know, Jerry Seinfeld saying that, you know, actors are the most useless, <laughs> useless, you know, performers there are. They don't write their own material. They don't come up with anything. They just, you know, stand on the spot and wear clothes that other people have designed and say lines other people have written a way that someone else tells them to say it. And then, Gary's saying, well, no, I think, you know, really good actors are just very vulnerable on stage or, you know, very vulnerable in front of the camera. And that's what he wanted to get with his comedy. Like he wanted to get to a point where it it wasn't really even an act. He wasn't getting up there with notes he prepared. He was just going to get up there and he was just going to talk and be honest and be totally unguarded and totally unfiltered and just drop as much of that performative stuff as he could. And I sort of saw a lot of that similarities with like the way that norm mcdonald would sit when something was bombing you know you saw the that roast he did the bob saget roast where he got up and deliberately did the worst most hackneyed 10 minutes of of comedy and just seemed to revel in the audience being uncomfortable and not being able to figure it out and it's like but but also he does this great line in pretending he can't work out why they don't like it (laughs) Like when he knows more than anybody in the room why they don't like it. The reason they don't like it is he intentionally set out with an idea that he thought they would not like and that's the joke. But he's up there like with this look on his face of like, I can't quite work out why you guys don't think this is amazing. And so the whole thing about him not telling anyone about the cancer, like 11 years or whatever it was, Mm. do you think, do you understand that? Is that something that you think you would do uh interesting uh oh i i think there's a there's a big part of me that would keep what really desperately want to keep that to myself but there's a more practical part of me that would probably be like if i'm dying of some disease and i want to leave anything behind for you know my family and my extended family my brother and sister's kids and all those that would suddenly be my attention and i'd be like you know what let's monetize this cancer (laughs) i'd be like yeah james was like get the terminally will poster that we've been designing for years ready to go we are getting on the road while i still can yeah because i was thinking about it 
and and I was like, I, I understand, you know, on one hand, not wanting to kind of invite that kind of scrutiny or having that be the focus of, you know, every tour he did or interview or radio show where, you know, people want to bring that up. But then I, I also think there's something really, I don't know, um, sad, you know, that he didn't get a chance for all this kind of outpouring of, of, of love for, you know, him or the work that he'd done. He never really got to experience. It's that thing about, you know, eulogies would be great to hear if you're still alive. I mean, did he, did he hear that enough? Did he think he just sort of felt like he, he didn't need any of that? Well, I mean, I think that that could be overwhelming. Like, you know, if you are a flawed person, like we all are, and you are at a point in your life where you're reconciling with the fact that like you're sick and you are dying and, you know, you have to look back on what you've done well and what you've done terribly and reconcile yourself with both poles of those things. Maybe he had, maybe he had to do a lot of, or maybe he hadn't at all. Maybe he just completely fucking ignored it and decided if I don't talk, I don't know. Like, I mean, I absolutely don't know. It's like, bit, it's hard to know unless you were in that situation, how you would handle it. But well, it's a bit like Chadwick Boseman, isn't it? The uh, yeah. guy who played Black Panther, like no one knew until the very end. And it's like, yeah, I think I, I don't know that I, I, I uh, I'm too desperate for sympathy. <laughs> I'd want, I'd want too many people to know. So that's when I'd expect people to start sending me like free shavers and shit in the mail. And that's where I, that's where I want the, the TOEFOP audience to really dig deep. When I, when I, but I think the sympathy could be overwhelming. Like, you know, sometimes you're just like, this is my own private battle and I just want to deal with it myself. Yeah. And other people's words and whatever can be draining. And you don't want people feeling sorry for you or you yeah. don't want people defining you by your disease. You're like, I'm still a person. I don't want to be defined by the fact that I have cancer or some other terminal illness and i think that's a very valid thing for people to want to not be defined by this thing's already fucking killing you mm. and then yeah you have to be defined by it no i can imagine why you would go but for me i'd just be like well i'm here all day and i've got some observations about you know <laughs> this experience so i guess this is what i'm talking about i guess you're right like i know talking to mum you know in her last sort of six months and when she decided to stop doing chemotherapy, like she talked about getting your identity back, you know, because, you know, she was a suddenly able to start doing the chemotherapy makes you so sick that, you know, she was able to start mm. being active again and, and riding a bike and catching up with friends and painting and doing all these things, even though it was a short window and she understood that it was a short yeah. window. I don't have much life to go, but at least I can live some of the life that I have. Yeah. A hundred percent. And on that note, <laughs> let's get to some mail. I mean, this has been a real journey, this one. It was pretty <laughs> funny at the Mr. Men shit. <laughs> uh, if you want to send us some correspondence, you can. You can go to tofop.com. There's a contact form there. Not for Fofop. Um, someone messaged me today to say, hey, how do I talk about Fofop? Look, just send it to Tofop. We'll read it out yeah. on this show. If you have any Fofop questions or feedback, it's you know, we'll hear it on this show. So just send it to the Tofop. And account. we never do a Fofop mailbag. So no. this this is, this is the this is the place for tofop business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and while you're there, you can check out some of the other extraordinary podcasts on the tofop network, like Willosophy. Who is on this week, Will? Uh, Max Barry, my childhood friend. And Max and I have been friends since high school. He is an incredible author. Um, he has a couple of new books out in the last year, both of which I've read and then both of which are excellent. He has a really cool um, football website. He's in, really into football statistics and um, why not? Anyway, it's it's worth <laughs> Googling it and listening to the episode. No, I won't go into the details now, but uh, uh, Max Barry is his name and uh, yeah, it's a cool episode. Hayfield has a pretty high strike rate when it comes to producing like media professionals, doesn't it? Like you, he was, how uh, yeah. Max Barry... <laughs> Well, I mean... Well, you'll leave it to so your level. <laughs> it was from, just one good from, year. <laughs> from the area, there are, yes. So Max is a very accomplished, you know, worldwide author. You know, yeah. he's had his books, you know, made into movies and stuff like that. And yes, Mark Howard is a very accomplished sports broadcaster. And, you know, I have four podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> One of the other podcasts we do is Fofop. My guest this week is Alex Williams. You might know him better as Julian Assange or Kurt Kambi Kurt Pengilly. <laughs> Kurt Pengilly. Kurt what's his name? Kurt Pengilly? Gilly. Yeah. Gilly Penger Gilly Pengerky. <laughs> what was his name? Kirk Pengilly. 
from the band In Excess. I don't have Kirk Bengilly. I have the actor who played him in the In Excess movie. <laughs> anyway, Alex Williams is on Fofop this week. You should check that out. And this week on Two Guys, One Cup is our grand final preview, which is especially exciting because Will's beloved Western Bulldogs are playing. They are. It's now getting it's getting oh, real. No jokes. You were full of laughs last week. Not anymore, mate. Yeah, I mean the lid's on. There's been a few requests for media this week. Right. I'm trying to, like in 2016, you know, the club obviously just needed all the press it could possibly get, and it was a huge moment mm. in our history. And I was very happy to, you know, do a whole bunch of related press from the spectators' point of view. And like, you know, I had some gear that I could roll out, and I understand why people wanted to talk to me, but. This year, like, I, it's not about me. I had nothing to do with this. You know, yeah. like, it, you know, my story would only be that I support the club. So I'm trying to just do a little bit of select stuff. But I've been asked to do quite a lot of related. I was asked to do the uh, Sunday Channel 9 footy show oh, program. Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I just, I didn't get to back to that one. You time. wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't. I mean, you'd be, it wouldn't be in the same room as him. He'd be in via Adelaide. You'd be via Sydney. That, that's yeah. yeah. You want to get close enough to be able to knife him. <laughs> you know what? You know what I will say. What? So I've started. This is how desperate I am for listening to football-related content this week because obviously it's been two weeks, mm. and you know, as I've already complained about, like the football shows are less regular during this time. The time that I want to completely consume football, there is less of it going around. So Kane Corns has a daily radio show um on adelaide radio and they podcast that yeah and the captain's run it's right. called and i have listened to the last week of the captain's run Ugh. hosted by kane corns that's how desperate, desperate. i am <laughs> for football content uh and if you are a fan of uh two guys one cup don't forget that this sunday following the grand final we are doing a live stream a live stream is that what it is i guess so it's yeah. like a, a zoom show live stream with michael and adam from the junk time podcast uh, and some very special guests um uh who are they again broden kelly from broden auntie kelly, donna who is a melbourne fan and Chaz lichardello from the chaser who is a bulldogs fan yeah so that'll be a barrel of last tickets are still on sale i'll get podcast mike to put the link in the episode description but now well let's get to some mail just a quick one to start off with this is from steve he says charlie if you haven't had any help with your incoming shaver from the u.s well steve i've had plenty of advice (laughs) email me as much info as you can on your old shaver and your new one and i'll see what i can figure out for you a photo of the nameplate on your old charger would be really useful too cheers steve now will the only reason i read that out because we i have had lots of electricians and electrical engineers contact me is he signs off by saying Certified electrical engineer, you keep on yapping, so we keep on zapping. <sighs> you know who we were complaining last week that we haven't had a good like update on we keep them laughing so that they could be living? Well, Sparkies, you got it. We keep on yapping, so you keep on zapping. <laughs> you dig? Yeah, I dig. See, the, this has been the previous mistake. They've always tried to go, you keep them laughing, so I keep them... Yeah, y- you've got to reposition what we're doing, yapping yeah. and zapping, yapping and zapping, <laughs> <laughs> laughing and living, yapping and zapping. Uh, this is from David. Uh, this is a faux fop question, Will. So I have no idea what he's okay. talking about. Um, well, it might be a faux fop he... related question to you. No, no, it's to you. Like, um, and he tells me off. The first thing, he he harangues me for not having a drop down uh, contact for Fofop. <laughs> and the second point is, I'm an American. I, mean, I figured that out from your first point. <laughs> so allow me to correct your misapprehension about directional schools. So what is this conversation relating to? I have no idea. Oh, okay. Should I read it or should I <laughs> skip it? <laughs> No, I, I'm very happy to. Okay. All right. So North Carolina, yeah. South Carolina, oh, South yeah. or North right. Dakota. Or do you know what this is, is ringing a bell? Yeah. So Justin and I were talking about a. Um, there's a particular American college football team that has a coach whose name might be Justin Hamilton, I think. And so Justin's yeah. been confused for him online. And he's been actually doing some like press for the local, you know, podcast radio and stuff like that. So it's been a very fun bit. And then we were trying to speculate on the names of the teams and the directions of the the teams right. and the states so okay yes. north to that right yeah okay um so he says north carolina south carolina south 
or North Dakota or West Virginia would not be included in this list since those schools have the same name of the state. They're the main schools in that state. That'd be the ones, the biggest conferences against the biggest competition. Directional schools are the second or even third tier schools in those states. So you might have Northeast Missouri State or Western Michigan where the main school would be Missouri or Michigan. Okay. So, yeah, so just to explain this further... Because there, yeah. there was this group of like schools that were referred to as the directional you know, right. division, right? And we okay. speculated it would be like yeah, South Carolina or whatever. Right, but you were just he's li- saying, being literal. He's saying, yeah, that's no, that's the name of the state. That would be the name of the team. We're talking subsets within these pre-existing places. Right. North, South, East, West, Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> a big school like Ohio State might schedule a couple of directional schools just to round out their schedule, so they'd uh-huh. take on some right smaller teams. A smaller school usually even gets paid an appearance fee to show up and get dra- get a dra- take a drubbing. The whole college football world, however, tends to celebrate when one of these schools actually wins against a Goliath. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, it can be sweet, unless you're a fan of a Goliath. Well, there you go. It's got a very Friday Night Lights feel to it, that bit of uh, mail. <laughs> this next one is uh, titled Wholesome Bin Content, and it's from Loren. She specified, uh, it's pronounced like Sophia Loren or Ralph Loren. Hello, Loren. Hi, Will and Charlie, but mainly Charlie. I've been meaning to write in for the longest time about a bin adjacent story from a few years back. I was living with my mum. And a house has a single car garage. And thanks to a yellow line, only one space for a car out the front of her house. This space was right next to her neighbor's driveway, who lives in a battle axe block. Every day, I would allow my mum to park in the garage and I would park behind her in the driveway. But it wasn't just any day. This was the day before bin day. I arrived home from work at a reasonable hour, aware that my mum wouldn't be home yet. As I was going to go to the gym the next hour, I parked out this on the street and figured I'd move to the driveway when I came back. I noticed the neighbour's bins on the curb where I parked, but as I wasn't going to be parked there for very long, I didn't think it was going to be an issue. Somehow in the hour between my parking there and going out again, the neighbour, a middle-aged white male who's also a barrister, all right, no need to say what race he is, <laughs> had worked himself up into such a rage that he left a note on my windscreen. Walking out to my car, I saw it and read, How am I bin supposed to get emptied? Think about it, all in capitals. (laughs) Oh, boy. Once home later, I parked as intended in the driveway. Now my mum was home. I tried to think of a good letter to write back, but decided against it, hoping he saw what happened and felt silly. All right, well, what would you write back if that was you? Well, I mean, you don't want to engage a barrister. This is a very expensive exercise <laughs> if you're suddenly trading letters with a barrister. I love the fact that a barrister can be brought to his knees. This is somebody who's like in the courts all day having to, you know, argue in the... Convict oh. Mr. Tickle. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sentence him tickles all week long. He comes home and it's the bins that break him. Um, <laughs> no, I, this is, yeah, massive overreaction. Like you've got yeah. to give people a couple of hours of... Like, you've got to give people an opportunity to move. Unless the bin collection was coming within the next... Like, I assume from this scenario, the bin collection was coming the next morning. So I think, yeah, no, the barrister's gone way too early. I also don't think, and, you know, as a guy who is very protective of my bins, I actually would... this, this, This particular infringement wouldn't bother me because... You see, when they do the bin collection, there's always one dude who's on his feet whipping the bins out and putting them into position before the truck gets there anyway. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, they don't leave you bin. They'll get, they'll get it, mate. They'll find yeah, they'll it. get it. Like it's the dude will just get out of the truck. <laughs> they have it hidden your bin. They're not going to put the through prong like, through the windscreen of your car. <laughs> three elaborate oh, well. clues to find where your fucking bin is. I bet it's behind the car. We'll roll it around. They've got a method, mate. Uh, Loren says to top it all off from then on he left an old Range Rover parked on the curb making a mess and leaking oil and he moved his bins to the other side of the driveway anyway so it wasn't even an issue he would regularly cut back my mum's tree when it was over when it overhung his car too one day my partner was over mowing my mum's lawn and saw him and asked him to move the car so he could finish the job and finally he did I guess being a male who we can't intimidate with angry letters made the difference anyway Thanks for all the great mundane content, Loren, not a doctor. <laughs> Good though. Good stuff. Good stuff. I love a bit of bin etiquette story. Uh, this is from 
Samantha, interesting, I thought this one. Uh, she wants to know, Russell Brand slash Joseph Gordon-Levitt, colon, cult leaders, question mark. Mm. Hey, Charlie and Will, I've been a listener for years and you've been a great source of comedy and occasional insight. But now, more than that, your voices are also a great source of comfort to me as having you both in my ears each week for so long has tricked my brain into thinking we're old friends. So thanks. We are friends though, Samantha. We are friends. <laughs> there are two topics I'd love to hear you guys discuss if you feel like it. The first is Russell Brand, uh -huh. who I once thought was funny and insightful and now I think is delusional and threatening. No, that's it. You summed it up very well. We <laughs> did need to add no more. Um, I'm predicting that he will be the next big cult leader. I frequently read the comments on his posts and his fans seem to worship him on different on a different level. It freaks me out because of his charm and skill with words could make him very dangerous, especially when you consider the, some of his opinions. I agree with some, but there are plenty that are problematic to say the least. Next, I read a funny article by David Farrier where he expressed how confused, intrigued and suspicious he feels about Joseph Gordon-Levitt's unusual behavior on social media to promote his mysterious website business. Mm. Thanks again for the pod guy Samantha right so Joseph Gordon-Levitt have you seen him are you to follow him on Twitter he's yes. got that hit record Joe that kind yeah. of artistic collective I've never investigated it I just assume it's like a star now call out for you know actors and writers and it is but like who's getting paid and what's it being used for and what's it all being fed into and why when he says I need you to record these four words now and send them through to me what's he doing with that I feel like Joseph Gordon-Levitt might be working with the AI. I feel like he might be sourcing shit. Like the on, sampling. Yeah, he's like, like this yeah. is what the machine needs fed into it right now. Everyone do it because <laughs> I'm Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yeah, I'm worried. Lock it in. So, uh, Russell Brand. I uh, Look, I don't... I don't... I, I've not... I dip in and out of Russell Brand. I find him entertaining. I, I like, I, what the, I like he, you know... His, his his flowery way of speaking, but I'm I'm not. I have got to admit, I have not delved deep into the brand of verse. I know he went on that big, you know, he was a revolutionary, and then he was a mystic, and then he was something else, and now he seems to be leaning to the right. Is that what's going on? Oh, uh, he's got some well weird, like there's some Joe wellness Rogan stuff. stuff and wellnessy right. stuff and spirituality stuff, like. But, well, he believes in God. I know that. It's like you yeah, know. but he does. Yeah, I don't know. He he believes he is God. I believe is closer to the truth. But I, I look. I've met Russell. Um, mm. I I don't pretend to know Russell, but I have met him a couple of times. And the thing that I always said about him was, whatever he's into, he's all the way into it. So when he was a sex yeah. addict, he was like all about sex. And when he was a heroin addict, he was all about heroin. And then. He became like a spirituality, a fame addict and a spirituality addict. Like whatever he's doing, mm. he is 100% like he can't be in recovery. He has to write, rewrite the 12 steps book and you know, a manifesto for recovery. Like that is what he is. And so <clears throat> is it dangerous that anybody who sounds super educated and sometimes he is super educated, but sometimes he takes two sensible things and his power of words makes it seem like those things are connected in a way that they are not connected. I mean, I think the sad thing with all this stuff is like, eventually it all gets commodified. Like I have not, I used to listen to the Joe Rogan podcast quite a bit, but I haven't listened to, there's a lot of podcasts I haven't listened to and I have not dipped into that universe in quite some time. And I checked in on it and I'm like, Whoa, when did it go so right? Like, like a lot of it is just so like, I mean, I know he's always sort of tread on the edges of um, conspiracy and all that kind of stuff. But what I used to like about the Joe Rogan podcast was the diversity of guests he had on. And, you know, I was like, okay, well, you know, he may not, I may not agree with everything, but it's a broad church and he does seem to speak to everyone. But now it feels like, no, it's mainly like MMA dudes and fucking people who want to own guns and, you know, the COVID's a fucking lie and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, God damn it. Like, I guess that's what happens when, because, you know, back when podcasting was still sort of like the wild, wild west and, you know, it was, it was a bit more loose, but it just sort of feels like, well, I think he, you know, he has, he has more people wanting to reach him now because of the influence he has. And I just feel like that's coming across now. Like I never thought he was clearly definable as any one thing. I always thought it was a, 
an unfair criticism of him back in the day where people were like he's right wing. I'm like, he's not right wing. Like he, the people he has on are very kind of diverse. But now I'm like, oh, everyone was way ahead of the curve. On <laughs> 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 and I guess Russell Brand's kind of the same thing. It's like, you know, there was a time where he felt sort of like counterculture or maybe he had something original to say, but yeah, I don't know. Oh, it also feels like the world is getting split very much into kind very, of much. very delineated lines where you are the one side of, of the spectrum or, or you're not. Just in general, if there's just one source you're getting most of your information from, it's probably good to just check with some other sources. Yeah. Like But do you do that though? Do you like check in like do you listen to sort of the more right leaning podcasts and publications and stuff? Do you sort of see what their commentary is to go, okay, well that's their perspective or do you feel like you know what their perspective is? No, I mean I would say that I sample more than I invest these days. Mm -hmm. Like I used to really make a point of like, you know, reading everything that, you know, particular writers wrote or like just to kind of, you know, listen to a, a bunch of like, you know, not like not necessarily right wing stuff, but definitely sort of like AM, you know, inner city radio that was kind of pitched at that more sort of like, you know, right wing conservative. Yeah, conservative part of the market, just to kind of see what arguments were being made there and what people were saying. But after a while, I mean, this is part of the thing I will say about the conservatives. It's pretty simple. Like it's pretty simple to like you only have to believe about four or five things. And you just lock mm. those in and that's pretty much it is the same every day. So mm. I, I try still and my job means that I obviously see a lot of like, I mean, we work in the area of seeing what narratives and counter narratives are. So I think through my work a lot, but I think in my real life now, the only like strong right wing content I get is like from AFL commentators on footy podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> They hate Dan Andrews. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting the gist of what the main arguments are just while I'm listening to some footy results. All right. Well, that is Tofop for this week. Thank you again uh, for tuning in. And don't forget, you can support us by going to patreon.com slash Tofop. Lots of great bonus content up there. There'll also be a brand new uh, bonus episode coming out this week. Uh, we'll be getting to some more of that Patreon mail because that's building up again. Every time I think the mailbag's empty, Will, it bloody fills up again. It's like people want to be involved in the show, God damn it. Good. No, it's good. That's a good thing. That's no, great. It's really good. Uh, and there was nothing else. Uh, oh, uh, uh, question everything, 8.30 Wednesdays on the ABC. Oh, yeah. This week on the show, um, Mark. Humphreys, who's very funny, oh, he's been on Willosophy. Uh, Tom Cashman is one back. of your best Willosophies, oh. I have to say. That one, that is that that's a classic. That where he talks about taking the tablets, <laughs> taking the tablets. I've never uh, anyway. It's it's honestly it's so like just my reaction. Adorable. I just it made me laugh so much. Uh, so Mark Humphreys on the show. Tom Cashman, who absolutely nailed it when he was on the show earlier, and. Uh, uh, Beck Melrose, um, who's very funny, who's open for me a few times, who she's making her debut on the show. So I'm really looking forward to having her on as well. Well, hopefully it'll be Melrose's place. Yeah. Boo. Hope she has better jokes than that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Charlie Clawson. I'm Will Anderson. 